trying to inspire the Macedonians to be as generous in contributing to his ministry to address the needs of the poor. And he wants to inspire them to be generous as the Corinthians have been. He talks in such glowing terms about the Corinthians in hopes that the Macedonians will be equally generous and that they will see an example of the capacity that God gives to us to do whatever we need to do, even despite adverse circumstances. The Macedonians knew the financial struggles that the Corinthians were experiencing because they are all being severely persecuted and unfairly treated. All of them are being intentionally targeted and pushed to the margins of equal participation in culture. They are always made to feel like the other in society and expected nonetheless to exist in this suffocating environment, thankful and satisfied, even with existence below and beneath what reflects fairness, equity, and acceptance. And any expression of protestation is seen as being not grateful and expecting far too much. And Paul wants them to know that following Jesus requires an understanding of how high and deep, how wide and long the possibilities and accesses are for us, both because of how powerful and mighty Jesus is and how much power and blessing he freely gives to those that would follow him. So here the Apostle Paul, as he encourages not only the giving of gifts to support his ministry to the poor, but also the expanding of a theological frame so that they might understand just who God is in Jesus Christ and then who they are because of Christ. Paul says, if I wrote any more on this relief offering for the poor Christians, I'd be repeating myself. I know you're on board and ready to go. I've been bragging about you all through Macedonia province, telling them Achaia province has been ready to go on this since last year. Your enthusiasm by now has spread to most of them. Now I'm sending the brothers to make sure that you are ready as I said you would be so my bragging won't turn out to be just hot air. If some Macedonians and I happened to drop in on you and found you weren't prepared, we'd all be pretty red-faced, you and us, for acting so sure of ourselves. So to make sure there'll be no slip up, I've recruited these brothers as an advance team to get you and your promised offerings all ready before I get there. I want you to have all the time you need to make this offering in your own way. I don't want anything forced or hurried at the last minute. And then Paul says, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. And I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give that will protect you then against sob stories and arm twisting because God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. And then verse eight, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. Now, I know you heard it, but hear it again in another translation. And God is able to make all grace, every favor, earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. Paul knows what they are experiencing. He knows that they are under the heavy weight of persecution. 
the struggle of sustaining survivable livelihoods. Paul knows the struggle they face, but he's teaching what they should live expecting. He knows what they are experiencing, but he's pulling on them to rest not in what they are experiencing, but in what they should be expecting. He wants them to get through what they are experiencing by being carried on the wings of what he tells them they can expect. And I love this bridge he has constructed that invites a person who is stuck and sunken by what is happening, what they are experiencing, which is best described as draining, irritating, frustrating, agitating. But life opens up and options beg for attention. Vision catches its second win. Energy becomes restored. Emotions experience a lift. Power is restored when you push past what you are experiencing and let God remind you of what you can expect. You can expect that you will have what you need when you need it. And where will it come from? It will come out of the total sufficiency of Christ, who Paul says is able to grace out of that sufficiency to you. I want to say it again. You can expect that you will always have what you need when you need it. And where does Paul say it will come from? He says it will come out of the total sufficiency of Christ who is able to grace out of that sufficiency to you. He is able to let that kind of grace flow in your life because he lives in a sufficiency that is so eternal. And he lives with such generosity when it comes to his grace that you can trust when he makes this promise to you. Whatever you are about to experience, don't let the size or demand or threat of it make you not seize the moment because I will extend favor to your life to make sure that you have what you need when you need it in order to get things done. Now, brothers and sisters, how does that change how perhaps you think about what you're being inspired to chase or required to face or motivated to walk towards? And how does that infuse you with the will to fight through these tough times and to face these demons that are again raising their ugly heads more arrogantly around us in the form of tense racism and court rulings and economic malfeasance and the list could go on and on and on. And I'm sure that you feel just like I do, so emotionally drained by so much bad toxic news about so many different things that it's hard to catch your breath, but you know you have to be watchful and keep the lamp trimmed and burning because you might miss something that represents another needle pushing event that moves the race forward and moves the culture towards a positive direction listening to the debates and hearing the divisiveness of the language and corruption of motives and absence of decency can make you believe that there's nothing to feel hopeful about but oh brothers and sisters I beg to differ and it's letting God take you across the bridge until you get a wider angle letting God walk you up to the precipice of the mountain so that on the summit of the mountain you can pull on your faith and your hope and then garner a wider glance nothing has changed at the base and the same things are happening but if you can change your angle and freshen up your perspective to see it not only through the lens of your experience but to see it through the lens of what you can expect it'll help you to see that even your heavy weighted experiences can be viewed in a brand new way how does a high unemployment rate another lynching another presidential lie another negative social media post how does all that sound when it is filtered through these words and God 
God will make all grace abound towards you so that you have everything you need to accomplish every good work. I I'll tell you what it does for us. It forces our faith to be sparked by this one reality that I think gets far too little attention. You know why I trust and wait for this kind of grace afforded to me by God to abound in my life. You know why I pray and lay my life and decisions squarely in the Lord's hands. You know why I get up every day to attempt to walk by faith and not by sight and why I greet hate with love and why I pray for those who would say all manner of evil against me falsely. You know why when somebody asks for my outer garment, I offer them my undergarment as well. You know why I walk through tough seasons talking to God with regard to my fears and fatigue and frustrations and why I'm always hopeful and able to say that this is a great time to plan for a great future. I'll give you the answer. It's because I am convicted at my core that you and I are in relationship with an all sufficient Christ. And because I believe that, I rest my life in the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ. I do. I rest my life in the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That when the culture comes up empty and when my engagements come up bankrupt, I do not have to slide down the ladder from emotional stability to emotional despondency. Why? Because my lift and launch, my joy and happiness, my sense of positive resolve is never anchored on the platform of just human engagement and cultural inclusion. The reason I get up every day saying this joy I have, the world did not give it and the world cannot take it away is because I've anchored my hope in the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ. A Christ who needs nothing outside of himself to be complete. Why? Because he is able to provide and to sustain and to protect without anything other than the counsel of his own will. His work in us is so totally complete and unto an eternal end. No mistakes in your personhood. No defects in your gifts. He knew exactly and precisely when you would be born, to whom you would be born, where you would be born, into the climate you would be born. He knew the hills. You would have to climb the mountains. You would have to stay the valleys you would have to walk through the experiences that would be attached to your life he knew what you would have to survive why because he's the creator of all things and in fact, all things were created by him. In him dwells the fullness of God. Every human alive can be made totally complete in him. All wisdom and revelation are hidden in him. Everything is under his authority. All our sins have been forgiven by him. He's the firstborn of all creation, able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. He existed before creation itself.